Hi, my name is Keith Moore. I'm the Director of Research for Pandas Physicians Network, a nonprofit organization focused on pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. Our vision is that PANS pandas will become easily diagnosed and treated by medical professionals with accessible proven therapies that dramatically reduce suffering and lead to a cure for these patients. Our guest today is Dr. Jennifer Frankovich. Dr. Frankovich is a clinical professor at Stanford University Lucille Packard Children's Hospital in the pediatric department of the Division of Allergy, Immunology, and Rheumatology. Her clinical expertise is in systemic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases that co-occur with psychiatric symptoms. In 2012, she established with other colleagues the Stanford PANS program where she is the co-director and created a longitudinal clinical database of patients with PANS pandas diagnosis. And also very impressively created a large biorepository of patient and controlled biospecimens to drive research on the immunological underpinnings of the illness. Dr. Frankovich was the recipient of the PANDAS Physicians Network 2021 research grant for her work to collect samples from healthy controls. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Frankovich here today. Thank you, Keith. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. um, you've been seeing patients at the PANS clinic for over a decade, and you were in the rheumatology uh, group. So how did you end up looking at PANS pandas or pandas at the time? I guess that was what it was called. Yeah. Um... It start so I was always interested in like the overlap between systemic inflammatory diseases and neuropsychiatric symptoms. Like I was particularly interested in neuropsychiatric lupus. And at the time of my fellowship, cases autoimmune encephalitis was actually just starting to get recognized. Mm. Um, and so even though the neurologists and you know general pediatricians and rheumatologists would work together to work up a case they often turn to the rheumatologist for help in understanding or, or um, sort of planning out the immune modulation. And, and so I was interested in that. So I was involved in a lot of the autoimmune encephalitis cases at Stanford. Um, in fact, I was part of the team that diagnosed the first case of NMDA receptor encephalitis even before oh the NMDA receptor antibodies were discovered. So we had made the diagnosis and stored the sample and then eventually figured out that it was an NMDA um, receptor encephalitis. So that sort of, and then we ultimately started a clinic for all basically autoimmune brain diseases. And I, I started this with Keith Van Heeren, who was a neurologist. And the goal was to see a spectrum, you know, to see all the cases and they're rare, right? Autoimmune encephalitis, CNS vasculitis, Bichette's disease affecting the brain, all of those things are really rare. But that was also at the beginning of the time when blogs were starting and somehow it got out there that we had this neuroimmune clinic and it was brand new, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, just very few centers at the time were starting these kinds of clinics. Um, and then we started seeing PANS patients, or at the time, I didn't even know what PANS was, right? I had heard of PANDAS, but what I was seeing was more fitting of PANS. Um, and so, but the neurologist I was working for, understandably, was really focused on diseases that had very hard neurological findings. So either an imaging finding or a CSF finding or you know, some, something that was concrete, right? And, and that's understandable from his standpoint that, but I had seen, I had been convinced because of lupus where a patient could have a neuropsychiatric exacerbation and really their lupus markers didn't flare or in their brain MRI was normal and their cerebral spinal fluid was normal. And so I felt like, well, what about all these other psychiatric cases? You know, we can only, you know, in my mind, the MRI technology was like a Polaroid picture and CSF studies were not great either. And so I felt like we needed to have a clinic for these kids with psychiatric deteriorations and no markers. And that's when I connected with Kiki Chang and Margot Tineman. And initially we were seeing 
you know, kind of a range of psychiatric deteriorations. But ultimately, we just got too overwhelmed with cases. So we eventually basically narrowed our criteria to only include um, kids that met the strict PANS criteria. Well, that, that's fascinating. And had you seen like OCD and anxiety disorders prior to this? I mean, you're coming from rheumatology. So just was yeah. wondering if you had seen all of this before. Well, so I, I'd actually, the, the only reason I knew about pandas was because I had a kid with enthesitis related arthritis who later after his enthesitis related arthritis was under control or gone, I can't remember, but he, de he developed pandas. So I did look into pandas and it seemed like a case that, that fit perfectly, um, Sue Sweeto's, you know, definition. And so I'd had that experience, but I'd, also, you know, as you know, there is a, an overlap between rheumatology and psychiatric disease. So many of my patients with psoriatic arthritis had anxiety, OCD, suicidality. Um, lupus patients have a lot of issues, you know, 10%, I think, of lupus patients have OCD, um, but also depression, anxiety, you know, a lot of things. So it wasn't unusual for us to be working with psychiatry you know, within our rheumatology clinic, but we didn't have like an embedded psychiatrist. So the PANS clinic was very unique in that we, you know, basically had a psychiatrist and a rheumatologist seeing patients together. And that was a new experience. So there's this whole question of whether it's over a spectrum or a distinct disorder. And do you have any opinion on that at this point, having seen so many children? No, that's a great question. I mean, I think it was very thoughtful of Dr. Sweeto to make this very clear group of kids that had hyperacute onset, you know, sort of temporarily associated with strep, because that's that's a great group to study. Um, it's just obviously more challenging when you're outside the research setting and you're in clinic, and many of your patients come to you outside the window of opportunity to diagnose strep just as it is challenging with Sydenham's Korea, right? I mean, that Sydenham's Korea <laughs> used to be very controversial and in the connection to strep was controversial for the same reason, right? And so I think then as Sue was smart to develop another criteria where you could still see those kids and still enroll them in research, even though you couldn't prove at the time that there was a temporal association with strep. And quite honestly, that's true for all post-infectious disorders, right? You can't prove an association in an individual that can only be done through epidemiology. Yeah. So I think by you know, having the PANS criteria, which is agnostic to the infection, really allows us to study it you know, and also deliver care to the patient, right? If you have a kid with a sudden deterioration, you don't know what the infection is, but they, they deserve some kind of treatment. <laughs> and you should study them too, <laughs> to learn more. Well, that's a sort of a fascinating um, structure because you, you've now talked about the acute onset, um, the hyperacute onset, which allows you to have a definable event. Uh, you commented on your neurologist wanting some something shown in the uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, um, something as a heart marker to see. But then you also have maybe the subacute onset. So do you see these as uh, like when you've seen subacute onset and hyperacute onset, do you see these as the same kids? Do you see these as separate kids? How, how do you view that? I mean, I still think we're trying to sort that out, right? I mean, right now our clinic, we're really geared to see the hyperacute. Um, but, you know, initially before we had a gatekeeper and we saw whoever showed up through the clinic, I had enough of the, you know, even like what's the difference between a kid that meets strict hyperacute criteria um, versus a kid that's acute, right? So the kid that it's clearly overnight versus the kid that's over a four day period, right? And you know, so I think there is a, a gray area and I don't know what, what the research is ultimately going to show, but in our database, we're separating them. Um, oh. And um, 
you know, and the other challenge we have is just like Sinham's chorea, right? With relapses of Sinham's chorea, it doesn't have to be strep. It might be a viral trigger. And so we're wondering if it's the same thing with PANS. You might, your initial explosive episode when you're in first grade may be strep, but maybe it got better in, you know, two months and you never made it to our clinic. And then you have an episode when you're in second grade that was some other illness triggered, triggered a relapse. So do you call that PANS or PANDAS or do you not? So, so I think that it's just tr kind of trying to keep track of the data and trying to keep track of e the relapses and is a relapse hyperacute or acute or subacute. I mean, we actually differentiate between hyperacute, acute, and subacute. Um, and I think we, in the end, my suspicion is, is it has to do with the infection and it has to do with the integrity of the blood brain barrier. Can you make a, can you make any comments about what did you mean by that separation of saying, well, maybe it's inflammation versus being uh, autoimmune? Well, autoimmune is a very specific thing. It, it implies the adaptive immune system, T cells and B cells, but the immune system has many arms, right? So something like lupus, we colloquially call it autoimmune, but it's actually on a spectrum and, and it involves both innate and autoimmune mechanisms. So I just was worried about, you know, even autoimmune encephalitis, like, you know, NMDA receptor encephalitis makes sense that that's autoimmune encephalitis. But what about, you know, street steroid responsive encephalitis associated with thyroiditis? I mean, we don't know that's autoimmune. That could be more innate immune system mechanisms and the, and the thyroid antibodies are a bystander. So I, I think that Madeline Cunningham's work and Chris Pittenger's work and, and lots and others have really shown autoimmune mechanisms for sure. Um, but I still suspect innate mechanisms as well. And so if you use the term inflammatory brain disorder, then you're basically saying, we're still looking at all the mechanisms. And even though there are autoimmune autoantibodies associated with pans pandas, what is driving most of the symptoms? I mean, Chris Pettinger's work and also Madeline's work really does suggest that autoantibodies are playing a role, but microglial activation may be playing a role too. And Betsy Mellon's work on brain homing monocytes that have the capability of turning into microglial cells. And, and the reason why we have to keep all of this under, under consideration is because it's gonna influence how we design trials in the future, right? I mean, if it was purely autoimmune, then rituximab should be the answer. But we've done, you know, rituximab and, and I'm feeling like it is not the, you know, it, it's not the magic bullet, just like it's not multiple sclerosis because multiple sclerosis involves other mechanisms too. I mean, it, it works, it's, it's great in many diseases, but you also have to cover the innate immune system. So that's why I'm trying to keep it in my mind <laughs> as someone that's trying to organize research, I'm trying to keep, op keep an open mind that there's different mechanisms, not just autoimmune mechanisms. That must be really difficult, I would imagine. So one of the things with the clinical database is you have all of these symptoms you're tracking and separating out, and then you have your bio database um, and a bio repository that allows the researchers to dive deeper on the mechanism. And so you're trying to keep both of these as pure as you can, which must be extremely difficult uh, to, to manage. And I guess that's another reason for the healthy controls to at least have a compare against. Uh, particularly in the bio repository. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, it's it is, and we tear our hair out trying to <laughs> trying to you know classify some of these patients. I mean, Margot Tiedemann has been so lovely and wonderful to work with, but she works really hard. We try to roughly classify patients, you know, into different groups, and then she goes back through and refines it, and you know, it's very time consuming, um, but important. Um, a lot of controversy was raised because researchers were studying different kids. Um, some were from the Tourette, you know, longstanding Tourette study group uh, with symptoms that hadn't remitted, and others with this overnight or very hyperacute onset of OCD. 
Do you think we now have a good handle on the presentation at this point? Do you, do you think that uh, researchers like in the PANS consortium are being able to uh, consistently identify uh, the same kids in different uh, locations and at different times? I mean, I think that as long as the researcher is asking the question, and I think they are, you know, what what did the onset look like? <laughs> um, the, you know, then they are the most likely are classifying the patients correctly. Um, I, I mean, there are certainly more challenging cases, right? Like every once in a while we'll have, I mean, like the case that we're trying to get into clinic today, it was so clear. She had absolutely no mental health issues, nothing in the family, and then overnight saying, you know, mm -hmm. it's clear, right? So cases like that are clear. But then there are cases where, you know, we'll see a kid where all of a sudden there's a week, they're just more agitated, a little bit more agitated, and they have sensory amplification. There's been a shift. They didn't, their parents may be subtly aware of it. And then they have this explosive onset OCD. So would you call that <laughs> overnight onset or not? And then you don't want to put them in the subacute you know, category because their OCD was, you know, hyperacute. So there's still, you know, some some problems with classifying, but this is true for every disease, right? Mm -hmm. It's every disease. So it shouldn't lead to co more controversy. It just means classifying humans that are heterogeneous, both in their genetics and in the infections they get and in their family environment, it's challenging to classify patients. It's, you know, even lupus, like huge challenge to classify. So I think people are doing the best they can. And this is why when there's a study that shows, um, sort of the same finding across different cohorts, like Pittenger's recent study where he studied three separate cohorts, even yep. in, and more recently he included ours. It's because each group sort of has a slight, even though you read the same, you know, mm -hmm. guidelines and you, you, the, the same criteria, you might have a different opinion on that one week of sensory amplification, right? Yep. Sue Sweeto may have said, no, then it wasn't overnight because it wasn't zero to 100. And maybe someone else would say, but the OCD was zero to 100, so I am going to classify it. So when someone like Chris Pittenger finds the same thing in three cohorts that were classified by different clinical teams, I think that really is, is helpful. And that's why you should do research across cohorts. Such a great example. <laughs> uh, You've likely drawn an awful lot of blood from these kids. Um, is there anything abnormal in the genetic makeup at this point that you're noticing? Yeah, definitely. We think we've found three immunogenetic markers. Mm. So they're associated, not definitive, like, like we know about most autoimmune diseases, there's many contributors, right? And so we've found three that we think increases the likelihood of PANS. We found that in our initial 100 cases or so, and we're trying to confirm it in a second cohort. Um, but then generally, like, yes, of course, we're seeing signs of, you know, subtle signs of basal ganglia, you know, sort of injury in terms of the neurological exam. We're not, none of us are neurologists, but Sue Suido taught us <laughs> the exam and, so, and we're doing it. Um, and so when we see a kid with abrupt onset and the neuroscience go along with, with basal ganglia injury, it helps us, but not all the kids have a neurological sign, right? The most common things we see is overflow dystonia, this piano playing finger movements, obviously that Dr. Suido has talked about a lot. Um, what else do we see? I mean, those are the two primary ones. Sometimes we see a positive glabellar tap, you know, in terms of where do you call it Sydenham's Korea versus PANS, I think that's always, of course, if they have flagrant, you know, Korea, then it's clear. But what if all they have is a milkmaid grip? Or what if all they have is tongue fasciculations or a darting tongue, right? Then you're like, well, do you call it Sydenham's Korea or not? And this is, you know, and I've talked to movement disorder specialists and they have a chance, you know, they, they don't know either, right? It's all how you classify it. Um, but yeah, so we see the neurological signs and then we see a lot of non-specific um, inflammatory markers, not, not surprising. So non-specific meaning that you could see these same markers in other inflammatory diseases. You, you might even see it in a healthy kid if you catch them right after an infection, right? So 
but thankfully, people like Madeline Cunningham and Chris Pinninger are trying to find the more specific markers. Well, we have over a hundred years of evidence kind of around Sinahan Korea at this point as being a group A beta hemolytic strep um, sequela. Um, and as you mentioned, it was all epidemiological studies that really were helping us see that. How do you feel is the evidence on Pam's canvas at this point about that linkage? To strep? Yeah, um, to strep. Well, again, so I think Tanya Murphy's study is um, great evidence, right? She didn't study Pam's pandas, right? But she clearly showed that kids with strep have more behavior issues and movement issues, right? Um, so she didn't do anything to, with that study to validate the association between strep, but you know, any intelligent person would make the next step that, okay, well, those are healthy kids and they clearly have some disruption when they have strep. So what if you take a kid that has other predispositions, right? So I think that was beautiful. Obviously the animal models by um, Madeline Cunningham and um, Patty Hornig and, and Dritan Agalia. I mean, those are great. Um, Unfortunately, animal models don't always reflect human disease, but that's okay. At least you're showing some impact. So I think that's helpful. And then the very large epidemiologic studies showing a connection between, you know, all the Nordic countries, they do great epi studies, right? Because every single <laughs> patient is in a database and they should have shown links between strep and OCD and the a new strep and a development of, of new OCD and strep and eating restrictions. So again, the epidemiology, and that's how they proved it in Sydenham's Korea, right? It was epidemiology. So I think that, you know, all together, yes, there's a link between strep and neuropsychiatric disease. Um, I think it's gonna take a while to actually like look at the PANS criteria and show an association, right? But people are working on that. I mean, that takes an epidemiologic study. I'm convinced <laughs> personally that there is a strong link, um, but you know, it's, it's hard to prove it in, in the way that the critics want us to prove it. And we just have to keep working on it. But in the meantime, I think children should get treated. That's my opinion. <laughs> So COVID-19, um, you know, is another viral element, and we're hearing a bit about neuropsychiatric issues in um, either long COVID or presentations, um, probably more in adults at this point, which we're seeing, but um, I, I just, I realized it was pitons, and you made a comment about the whole area of, an, of uh, either post-infectious or inflammatory uh, brain uh, disease. Um, uh, can you make any comments like uh, on COVID-19 uh, and what you're seeing uh, at the clinic? Um, again, this may not be studied. It's just sort of a general area. I'm wondering what you're seeing. Yeah, no, it's a fair question. Um, I think that um, so during the quarantine, interestingly, we saw, and I don't want to say no cases because I wasn't in clinic every single week, um, but we're about to do a study. We, we didn't see new onset PANS cases, like classic PANS cases. And interesting. we didn't have major relapses. We had kids with ongoing flares, right? And we had kids with issues, but in terms of a brand new relapse, I don't think that we had those during the quarantine. And we'll look through our database to make sure. Um, so I, so that's what we saw during the quarantine. Um, we have had a handful, so during the quarantine before Omicron, we did have a handful of patients get COVID, our existing patients who were in, you know, nice remissions or relative remissions, they did fine with COVID. So, but I don't know if they did fine with COVID because we had them on an NSAID or some anti-inflammatory or if COVID just wasn't an issue. But I have heard of a few cases of what, I mean, there's been one reported case of PANS after COVID. A colleague on the East Coast has a case of a, pan, a PANS case. He's very convinced it's a PANS case after COVID. And then we have a community member 
I mean, a community pediatrician who's who believes she's had a case. So it's it's possible, but I also question in those cases, did they have concurrent strep? I have no, there's no question that COVID causes neuroinflammation, right? I mean, they've shown even, co, you know, the coronavirus in brains and lots of inflammatory stuff, demyelinating disease. So there's no question that COVID causes neuropsychiatric, um, post-infectious neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, how much it's going to overlap with the classic strep associated case, I don't, I don't think we know yet. There's probably going to be some immunogenetic overlap. There's probably going to be some mechanistic overlap. Um, but, you know, people, Carlos Bustamante is a geneticist here, here at Stanford who's started a huge biobank um, called um, the Biobank of the Americas. And he plans to study, you know, post-COVID and PANS and PANDAS. So I'm hoping through, because he's planning such a huge study that we might be able to start teasing out these differences and understanding the pathways better. I did want to ask you a bit about sort of the gut brain linkage as well. And I know that's a very different angle from most of what we ask about, but um, maybe more on the vagus nerve uh, dynamic and saying, is, has anyone looked down that path? Because you comment about inflammation, Mm -hmm. comments about um, autoimmune, and then I'm wondering a little bit about, well, what else may be going on uh, in the gut flora, particularly since we, you know, we have seen some of that um, changing to the gut flora due to maybe antibiotics, another dimension that may not have anything to do per se mm -hmm. with um, the original antigen or the original uh, bacteria. Just a question in that space about gut flora and whether anyone is looking down that direction. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I mean, as we're learning, the microbiome is important for lots of diseases, even, and I mean, they're even showing, you know, your microbiome predicts your outcome from chemotherapy and cancer treatment or a bone marrow transplant, or, I mean, you name it, if there was money to study it, <laughs> the microbiome <laughs> appears to be relevant. So I would have no doubt the microbiome is one of the factors that, is playing a role in pans pandas, whether it plays a role in, you know, the onset symptoms, the severity, the, you know, outcomes, you know, it's no doubt playing a role because it's a major regulator of inflammation, right? Um, so in terms of, and, you know, the other reason why we think it's going to be important is because 50% of the kids coming to our clinic that meet the strict pans criteria have some type of GI symptom when they present. And that's, that's actually that, that fraction is higher than even the kids that come to our clinic and they don't meet PANS criteria. And as you probably read the Italian study, you know, did point out some microbiome differences in the, even before the kids got antibiotics. So it is, we're, we're starting to collect microbiome samples. Our clinic is not gonna have enough to really analyze, right? There's just, if the microbiome is too diverse, you need a large population, but hopefully in combination with other clinics that will have enough samples to eventually study. Juliet um, uh, uh, from Dartmouth is actually, yeah. uh, you know, planning to lead the, you know, people in microbiome studies of the GI maiden is their last name. So I, I think that it will move forward for sure. The reason for the question was just the prevalence of sort of anorexia showing up or uh, the acute uh, uh, restricted food intake disorder. And so it was a question in the kids that you see, how often does that symptom present? How often are you seeing that as opposed to other dimensions of OCD or non sort of food restrictive um, activities? Uh, can you give some sense of how prevalent is that in what you're seeing? Yeah, I think it's about 50% of our patients have some type of food restriction huh? um, coinciding around the time of their PANS onset. Um, sometimes it's more subtle that they just narrow their palate um, or, you know, we've have oftentimes families will comment that 
you know, they used to have a diverse sort of palette and now all they want is carbs, <laughs> right? So there does seem to be a change. Some of, in the, And then you have the other extreme where the kids really restrict and they lose weight. Um, and a lot of time, you know, m much of the time it has to do with some type of contamination fear or OCD, but there's, there's another component to it, which some of these kids just, they just don't eat as much when they, and they don't drink as much when they develop hands. Um, so it's definitely an issue um, in about 50% of our patients. So the JCAP articles separated out mild, moderate, and severe presentations. Um, do you see all three? I think you mentioned, uh, um, well, do they come to you with all three or uh, how does that get presented to you? Do you see all three presentations? Yeah, we definitely see all three presentations, um, especially now that the pediatricians in the area are aware of this and they're referring earlier um, and younger, right? Um, we're, we're definitely seeing seeing the milder versions. When we first started our clinic, it was the, only the desperate that came and they were the severe cases. Um, there's probably a lot of mild cases um, that the kids get better without a lot of intervention. Um, and so, you know, we've definitely had some families cancel their appointment with us probably because they got, you know, presumably better. So maybe just we could talk briefly about the journey um, what's the journey that um, sort of parents and kids go through to get to you? What, what's that journey like for most of them? Um, is it something that now that pediatricians are more aware of the clinic, that's easier? Or how often is it a referral from a pediatrician or a psychiatrist? Or how do they get to you? Yeah, so we, we require a referral. Um, okay. But... I think a lot of times, so sometimes um, it's the pediatrician is familiar with it. They recognize it. They call us, you know, just like I got a call on Sunday and it was the pediatrician had seen it before and another one of her patients, she recognized it immediately and she's calling us to get the patient in right away. That's the perfect situation, right? Where we can get the kid in early. Um, sometimes it's the parents that figured, oh, actually, I would say the majority of time it's the parents, right? They're, they, you know, Google the symptoms and they figure out it's PANS and they go to their pediatrician and ask for a referral. And that's uh, fine. We've had therapists and psychiatrists refer patients. Um, so it's, they come from, you know, different avenues. Unfortunately, our clinic can only accept one in 10. Wow. So a lot of the, the patient, right, just because you know, we have a limited number of clinicians and we have to, you know, you can only see so many patients in a day, right? So right now, because we couldn't see every kid, we only see the new onset hyperacute, you know, cases for the most part. Um, so, you know, what happens to the other nine out of 10, they're probably paying out of pocket for, you know, sort of a niche clinic somewhere. Um, do you have any suggestions for a frontline pediatrician um, who is thinking it might be PANS, PANDAS, anything that they should do um, early on? Well, I think if they're willing to take the time to call their local, you know, now there's, and you have them listed on your website, but there's a number of academic centers that do have PANS PANDAS clinics. So I think if you live in an area where there's a PANS PANDAS program, the best thing you can do for the patient is get them there and let the PANS PANDAS specialists do the workup. If we see a flagrant inflammation, then we can in the records <laughs> say like, this, this is the evidence for this child that we have that this is basal ganglia related and it has, uh, and we strongly suspect inflammation. And I think that helps the child long term to have that well documented. And obviously, there's a lot of pediatricians out there that don't have access to an academic center. And so they do have to treat. And so, what I would tell them is go on the PPN website <laughs> and look at the treatment algorithm <laughs> because it's so nicely laid out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to that point, um, are there things that we could do at PPN that would be beneficial to you and the other researchers and clinicians who are 
um, studying. Well, I think um, right now, since there's an IVIG trial, it would be nice if all of the programs, the Pandas Network, the PPN, the Neuroimmune Organization, Aspire, if they could all advertise the IVIG trial so that all these kids get funneled to a center where there's the IVIG trial. Even if the family goes to the center and they ultimately decide not to do the IVIG trial, still, it's it's this is going to help the effort and I think also help the individual child really getting a a, a nicely documented neuro exam in, in sort of the standard lab workup. Um, so I think that would be great if all of the if all the foundations could point to the trial. <laughs> that's going to move research forward. Can you mention what you're seeking in healthy controls? You know what you're excluding. You know, kind of healthy control, except for what? Yeah. So. I mean, as you mentioned, we have been collecting uh, blood samples on kids with PANS, so clear PANS as, and also other neuropsychiatric deteriorations. Um, and we've been capturing these um, blood draws in, when the children are in flare and as they go into remission and when they're in a, a good remission. Um, so when, and then the goal of our program is to just distribute these samples to basic scientists who are studying the immune pathways. And although a big part of our research is comparing the flare draws to the remission draws, we also want to see how these flares compare to healthy kids. Um, and in the past, we've had no problem getting healthy kids to enroll in our research. But since the quarantine, we actually continue to distribute samples during the quarantine, but we weren't allowed to collect healthy controls. So we basically depleted our healthy control biobank. Um, now that we've restarted it, we're having a you know, pretty big challenge getting healthy kids back into our research center for blood draws. Um, there's, I, I think we're, we're not the only ones having a hard time getting healthy controls. There's a lot of researchers I work with that are struggling to get healthy controls as well. Um, definitely a lot of our research we could compare to other diseases, um, but those samples are precious to researchers as well, right? So we have the, fortunately had access to some juvenile arthritis samples to some samples of kids with autoimmune encephalitis, with allergies and asthma, and those have served as controls. Um, but we also like to see how how healthy kids, um, you know, so it's, it's nice to have two control populations, kids with other immune diseases and kids with that are perfectly healthy. That really gives you a bigger understanding because um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap. Like we do think there's some overlap in some of the immune signals in childhood arthritis, right? And so in order to understand those overlaps, you really have to study all of these groups. Would siblings be okay in the healthy control or are you really looking for outside of the familial context or outside of someone with a familial diagnostics of a uh, yeah. neuropsychiatric disorder? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Siblings would be a, uh, their own control group, and we have collected sibling blood, but we've also found that a lot of our the siblings of kids with PANS have, they don't necessarily meet PANS criteria, but they have some other neuropsychiatric disorders, um, or they have arthritis or some other autoimmune disorder, which is not surprising, right? Like most autoimmune diseases are multi, um, like genetic, right? There's many genes that contribute it. So in one kid, just like in any family, one kid could have type one diabetes and another kid could have celiac disease. And that's what we're still seeing in this patient population is that oftentimes the siblings do have something, not all of them, but enough that we need, we, we do have to focus on a healthy control group that's not related. Well, you have been so gracious with your time and thank you for, um, both uh, this interview and so much that you have done for the children over the last uh, decade. And I really just deeply appreciate you and your work and the other researchers who are studying this disorder. And uh, thank you again for your time. No, absolutely. And I'm just here representing the whole group. There's a team of amazing clinicians, you know, in our clinic 
um, you know, that have been with me for a long time, Margot Tiedemann, as you know, and now Teresa Willett and Bahari Farhadian. And then, you know, we have some great scientists. We have now 35 scientists that are actively sort of helping us think through the problems we meet every Friday. Um, so, and, you know, I have to say, give you kudos because you were, you were one of the first people to invest in our efforts. So you can take credit for the progress we're making. Well, thank you. Yeah. And uh, again, congratulations on a really successful uh, creation of the clinic and um, deep appreciation for everything you're doing. Thank you, Keith. Thank you so much.